If you've got your Bible, I'm going to read you from the book of Ephesians and chapter 1. That is one of Paul's letters in the New Testament. There are Bibles in the seats if you didn't bring your own with you this morning. And if you've been with us in the last couple of weeks, you'll know we're beginning to look into this letter of Paul to the Ephesians. And I want to read to you this morning from chapter 1, verse 3 down to verse 14. This is 12 verses. And in the original Greek in which this was written, Paul wrote one very long sentence that made up all of those verses. Now, our translators have conveniently broken it up into manageable sentences. But if I was to read this with the full effect that Paul wrote it, I ought to take a deep breath and read all 12 verses without inhaling. But I won't try to do that, because by about verse 8, I will go blue. And by verse 10, I will fall over. And before verse 12, I will be dead. <laughs> so I won't do that. But I want you to get the sense of this statement of Paul, a bit like a snowball rolling down the hill, gaining momentum and volume and size as it goes, as he talks about, and this is the theme of these verses, the incredible fullness of that which we have in Christ. In Christ is his primary theme and what, what that means to be in Christ. Let me read you then from verse 3, where it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which is freely given us and the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Phew. <laughs> not only is it long, well, it's not long, but it's long as one sentence, as originally written, but it is packed with all kinds of important truths. That there's going to be no dessert today. It's just meat. <laughs> and uh, that's what Paul is giving. And then actually, as we go into the rest of the book, a lot of these things, uh, trails from them or leads from them, go out into other parts of this book. Stephen Hawkins is the well-known Cambridge physicist and cosmologist. And his pursuit in life is to look for what he calls a theory of everything. That is, one explanation which encompasses physics, chemistry, life itself, natural laws, history. In fact, that encompasses and gives us an explanation for everything in the universe. Well, he hasn't quite found it yet, though his most recent book, The Grand Design, claims to be moving towards that goal. It's an interesting concept that everything be reduced to one theory that explains everything, but I wonder if there is a theory of everything for the Christian life. If we could reduce the Christian life to one theory, 
statement, if you like, of what it is, how it operates, what it does. Is there such a statement? And I want to suggest to you that there is, and we find it here in chapter 1 and verse 3, where Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now that is as an inclusive statement as we could possibly make. Every spiritual blessing, what's left out of that? It's all embracing. In the heavenly realms, that's a phrase that Paul uses only in Ephesians, and it only occurs in Ephesians in the whole Bible, but he, he uses it six times in this letter. And whatever else is involved in the heavenly realms, it involves the whole cosmos. So there's nothing bigger than the heavenly realms. So every spiritual blessing in every place possible in the heavenly realms. And where is this? It is in Christ. That is, that Christ is the source, the substance, and the goal of the Christian life. What's missing from that statement? The answer is nothing, because God has nothing to give us outside of Christ, and he has everything to give us in Christ. Therefore, we need to understand what it means to be in Christ. I talked a little bit about this last week when I talked about the two addresses at which these people receiving the letter lived. The saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ, they lived in Ephesus, they lived in Christ, and we talked a bit about that last week. But now we have some more amplification of this. And when he talks about we have every spiritual blessing, in the following verses, he lists a number of things. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but he lists a number of things, a number of key things that we have in Christ. And I just point them out to you very quickly. We're not going to talk about all of these, but just point them out, and this will help to set the scene for what I'm going to say in a few moments. Verse 4, firstly, he chose us in him before the creation of the world. In verse 5, secondly, he predestined us. Thirdly, to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Fourthly, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Fifthly, he made known to us the mystery of his will. And then he reiterates a couple of things in verse 11 by saying there, in him we were also chosen, having been pre predestined according to the plan of him who works with everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So he brings up again this idea that we are chosen and predestined. And then he, sixthly, in verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now those are six things there that he says are part of these every spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. In fact, ten times in these verses, he uses the term in Christ, in Christ, in him we have, in him we are, in Christ we received, and so on, because that's what this is really all about. Now, we don't have time, nor could I adequately deal with everything in these verses here this morning. But I want to pick out two main issues with which he begins when in verse 4 he says he chose us in him before the creation of the world. And in verse 5, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons. 
I want to talk this morning about these two issues of being chosen and being predestined. And he repeats them as I pointed out in verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Let me then talk, first of all, about what it means when it says he chose us in Christ. And then we'll look at what it means when it says that he predestined us in verse 5. Now, I am sure that many of us in this building this morning have wrestled many times with statements such as this to talk about our being chosen in Christ. There are 11 such statements in the New Testament. Some of us have thought a lot about this. Some of us have not thought very much about this. And some of us don't want to think about this. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you just to bear with me a little bit this morning because uh, I need to do a bit of donkey work with you as well as coming to the point of this and the applications of this and the implications of this that we need to talk about. Let me say, as a general rule of thumb, when you're trying to deal with something that at first seems a little difficult uh, and confusing, that we must be careful of interpreting scripture in isolation from the rest of the Bible so that we sometimes come up with an understanding which sounds good and right in this immediate context, but when you compare it with the rest of Scripture, you find it runs into conflict. Now, I know everything is not neatly packaged, and there are some areas where we have mysteries. In fact, Paul talks here about the mystery of his will. The difference between a mystery and a riddle is that you can solve a riddle. And there are mysteries whereby we look into the, sometimes into the mist of them. No pun there, but the mystery. But it's like a mist, and you pick up something, but there's still some mist, and you pick up something else. And there are mysteries, we know that. But I want you to uh, stick with these next minutes. There are those who understand this as God arbitrarily choosing who should be in Christ and who should not be in Christ. And that this is a decision that he has made and made it before the foundation of the world. That raises, of course, all kinds of problems in most of our minds. Let me point out to you that here in Ephesians, both times he speaks of being chosen, he says in verse 4, he chose us in him. In verse 11, in him we were also chosen. I suggest to you this is the key for us to understand this, that we are chosen in Christ. And I suggest to you that throughout the New Testament, that being chosen is always and only in Christ. Now, this is a big clue. And as I implied a moment ago, when you come across something in a particular part of the scripture, it's always good to see what else is said in the rest of Scripture, because this book, the Bible, of course, is a unity. And although it's made up of 66 different books, 
27 in the New Testament, 39 in the Old Testament, and they were all written at a particular time by a particular person to a particular reader or readers with a particular purpose in mind, and therefore each book does stand alone to a certain extent, but each book is not sufficient alone. If we had a Bible that was just the book of Isaiah, there'd be lots of things we wouldn't know. If it was just the book of Ephesians, lots of things we wouldn't know. If it was just the Psalms, there are lots of things we wouldn't know. And so as we... we, we study the scripture in its immediate context first of all, we then have to see what is the bigger picture that God is giving to us in scripture about this particular theme. And as I've said to you before, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. It's also the cheapest, and it's the most reliable. It's a bit of hard work sometimes to run around it, but we need to get to know this book. We have no other source of understanding other than that we take time to read and understand and study this book. The word chosen is a word that appears right through the Old and the New Testament. And it appears in four main contexts and in two minor contexts. The four main contexts are these. I'm going to point them out to you because I think this will be helpful to us in understanding what Paul teaches here in Ephesians and in the New Testament generally. The first context is that the nation of Israel are spoken of as being chosen by God. There are a number of verses, Isaiah 45 verse 4, where God says, for the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen. And uh, God speaks of Israel there as being chosen. There are many other verses. That's just one at random that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm giving to you in the Old Testament. In the New Testament also, Acts 13, verse 17, when Paul is preaching, he says that God and the people of Israel chose our fathers. God chose them. And in Romans chapter 9, which is the great chapter on the choosing of Israel and the reasons why God chose Israel, and we'll go there in just a moment, just for a couple of minutes. But um, in Romans 9 verse 11, God speaks about choosing Jacob over Esau. They were twin brothers, you remember. Esau was the older. In natural, in the natural course of events, he would become the inheritor of the blessing and birthright from his father, but actually Jacob the younger received the blessing and the birthright, and it says it was in order that God's purpose in election might stand. And by the way, the word election, the word chosen, it's the same word electos, uh, just the translators translate it as they feel appropriate at the time. So in order God's purpose in election, in choosing Israel, might stand, that he he chose Jacob over Esau. Now, there's also a remnant of people within the nation of Israel who later become called a remnant chosen by grace. Romans 11 verse 5 talks about it. There was a time when the people turned away from God, most of them, but there were some that were left. There were 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal, said God to Elijah. And speaking of that time in Elijah's day, there's a remnant chosen by grace. So there's an elect within the elect that God speaks of there, a chosen group within the bigger chosen group of the nation of Israel itself. Although nine and a half of the 12 tribes of Israel eventually went into oblivion because of their turning away from God. The second context is that Christ is the chosen one of God. So here's a reference in Luke 9, 35, of the transfiguration. You remember that event? And the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Electos, same word. Uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, verse 4, As you come to him, the living stone chosen by God and precious to him. There are also verses in the Old Testament that anticipate the coming of Christ, the Messiah, Isaiah 42, verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. Very similar to the words the Father spoke from heaven at his transfiguration and actually at his baptism. And uh, this is a, the beginning of what we know as the servant songs that are messianic in Isaiah and he speaks there of Christ as his chosen one. So Christ is described as being chosen. 
And then the apostles are described as being chosen. In Luke 6, it says that Jesus called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he designated apostles. Later he said, you did not choose me, I have chosen you. And by the way, when he said it a second time, he said, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you, and one of you is a devil. But nevertheless, they were his chosen 12. And then Paul is later added to this group by the language that is used. Acts 9.15, God said to Ananias, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. The fourth category is the church or believers. There are 11 references to that in Scripture. In Ephesians 1 verse 4, he chose us in him. Ephesians 1.11, we've just been looking at. In him we were chosen. And uh, here's another reference uh, from uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Now, these are the four main categories who are described as being chosen. Israel, the remnant in Israel, Christ, his apostles, and his church. There are a couple of um, minor, uh, fairly insignificant comments as far as we're concerned this morning. Uh, it speaks about the elect angels in 1 Timothy chapter four, 5. I'm not absolutely sure what that means. And when John writes his second letter, he addresses it to the elect lady. And it could possibly be a church, if so, probably the church in Ephesus. It could have been a particular lady, but it's not really relevant to the point I want to make to you this morning. But those are all the references to people being chosen in Scripture. Now, let's just go back to the beginning of this and ask the question, what does it mean for Israel to be chosen? They're the first category of people. Chosen for what? Well, in Romans 9, which is one of the important chapters on Israel being chosen, Paul lists a number of benefits in Israel being chosen. And if I can just read this to you from verse 2, Romans 9, Paul says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. That's the first thing, he says, is the benefit of being chosen by God. Theirs is the divine glory, that which God revealed in giving the law in particular, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises, theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. And Paul there says there are eight benefits in Israel being the chosen of God. And he lists them. The first seven are all preparation for the eighth. The ultimate purpose of Israel being set apart is that they would bring Christ. There would be the means by which Christ would come into the world. And when God had spoken to Abraham, he promised to Abraham, it is your seed, singular, that is going to bless the world. Paul makes much of that in Galatians. He did not say to your seeds. It's not the whole nation I'm talking about. It's the seed of Abraham that is going to be the source of blessing in the world, which is Christ. So the other things, the, their adoption of sons, the divine glory, the covenants, their receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises, the patriarchs, were all preparation for the coming of Christ himself. Now, if God's choosing of Israel was a means to an end, not the end in itself, but the means to blessing the world, ultimately by bringing Christ, then it's very interesting that missing from those eight ingredients is the salvation of the people of Israel. 
Salvation is not included. The possibility of salvation is included. A lot of the temple worship was all about bringing blood sacrifices to appease the just wrath of God. Not that they could take away sin, only the blood of Christ could do that, but they covered it until the blood of Christ removes it. So it wasn't that they couldn't be Christian, of course, that's not the point. But Paul says, having in chapter 9 talked about the benefits of being the chosen people of God, he says in chapter 10 and verse 1 of Romans, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Because being saved is not inclusive in their being chosen here. And therefore, to be the chosen people of God is to be the vehicle, if, you might, if I might say that, the vehicle by which God fulfills his purpose in the world. And if you're in Israel, you're part of the chosen. If you're not in Israel, you're not part of the chosen. But there are those in Scripture who were born outside of Israel, who became an Israelite, and in becoming an Israelite, they became part of the chosen people. They were not chosen outside of Israel. They were only chosen in Israel. Ruth would be a good case of that. Ruth was a Moabitess, you remember? And the Moabites were banned from the assembly of the Lord, it says, for many generations. And Ruth, a Moabite, married an Israelite, and when she became an Israelite, became one of the chosen people. She wasn't outside of Israel because the chosen people were not non-Israelites. They were Israelites. One of the heroes in the wilderness journeys of the Israelites were Joshua and Caleb. And Caleb, interestingly, one of the two men who really believed God and who was allowed to arrive in Canaan 40 years after they left Egypt when everybody else of the age of 20 had died and he was an old man up into his 80s by the time they got into Canaan. And Caleb was a Kenazite by birth, which was a leading family of the Edomites, and the Edomites were outside of the purposes of God. But by becoming an Israelite, Caleb became one of the chosen people. And then, of course, there were many people who turned away from God in the Old Testament, and there was just a remnant chosen by grace who retained the purpose for which God had set them apart in order to bring the Messiah and to bless the whole world. So under the Old Covenant, the chosen people of God were the Israelite nation. If you were in Israel, you were amongst the chosen. If you were not in Israel, you were not one of the chosen. Under the New Covenant, it is Christ who is the chosen of God. And God's work under the New Covenant is done in and through Christ, and the central idea in Ephesians 1 is that we are chosen in Christ. Christ is the fixed point. Christ is the chosen one. And when you come to be in Christ, you become, amongst other things, one of the chosen people of God. They're not chosen to be put into Christ. Nowhere does Scripture say that. We become the chosen by virtue of being in Christ. You see, in the New Testament, we are in one of two positions. We are in Adam or we are in Christ. Now, to be in Adam is to be in our natural unregenerate state and out of the will of God and out of relationship with God, separated from God. That is the natural state to be in Adam. The other position is to be in Christ, which is to be regenerate. It means that we've been reconciled to God and we've become the recipients of spiritual life, which is the life of God that is imparted to us. No one who is in Adam is amongst the chosen. Because you're only one of the chosen when you're in Christ. And by being in Christ, we become chosen. Let, let, me, let me illustrate this. I've tried to think of some illustrations. And you're at the point at which you need one. <laughs> I travel many miles each year in many parts of the world, 
And I choose to fly on airlines that are part of the Star Alliance network. There are a number of inter-airline networks, and I choose to fly with the Star Alliance network, and this is to my advantage because you can accumulate mileage points and you can cash in mileage points in the whole variety of airlines within the, within the Star Alliance. And because I travel so much, they very kindly send me once in a while some upgrade certificates, and so you get some benefits, and uh, once in a while you get upgraded. So that's all very nice. And uh, Air Canada is part of the Star Alliance, Lufthansa, the German airline, United Airlines, US Air, Singapore Airlines, Austrian Airlines, there's a whole range of them. And uh, when I buy my ticket, I buy a Star Alliance ticket, so I may buy it from Air Canada, and I may leave Toronto on Air Canada, let's say when I went down recently to um, South Africa, I went on Air Canada to London, I went on Swiss International from London to Johannesburg, and I went on South African Airways from Johannesburg to Cape Town, and they're all part of the Star Alliance. So I arrived in London, where am I going now? Swiss, oh really, on Switzerland, where is that? Well, because they're part of the Alliance. Now I didn't choose Swiss, I chose Star, Star Alliance, and because they're in the Star Alliance, then they're part of the chosen means by which I travel. When I was last in Egypt, Egypt Air was not part of the Star Alliance, but it's since become part of the Star Alliance, and so back in July, I flew Egypt Air, because I found they're now in the Alliance, and so they're part of my chosen means of travel, and I get all the benefits from, from doing so. I didn't choose to put these airlines into the alliance. When they're outside of the Star Alliance, they're no benefit to me, apart from getting from A to B, but none of the perks go with it. But when they are in the Star Alliance, they become part of the chosen category of airline by which I'm going to fly. Now, that may be a very poor illustration, but what I'm meaning by it is this. If you're outside of Christ, you're not one of the chosen. Nobody in Scripture is one of the chosen outside of Christ. It is when we are in Christ that part of being in Christ is not just that my sins have been forgiven and I'm going to heaven when I die, but I've been incorporated into Christ, baptized by the Spirit into Christ, into his body, I am now part of his means of fulfilling his agenda and his purpose in the world, which is always through his church, his chosen ones, his chosen people. Don't read Ephesians 1, 4, God chose us before the creation of the world, that isn't what it says. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world. That is, that God determined before the creation of the world that Christ would be the means by which he would bring about his purposes. Revelation 13 tells us about Christ as the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. All this was anticipated, of course, by God. And that when you and I are brought into a relationship with Christ, when we come to be in Christ, we're brought into a history that goes back to the beginning of the world, but now you're part of, and previously you weren't. Now, if you look at all the 11 references to Christians being chosen, if you think of them as being about salvation, and it's a very popular view that people are chosen to be saved, and by default, other people are chosen not to be saved, then you're going to run into some problem verses. But if you read it with the understanding that to be chosen means to be in Christ, and therefore the emphasis of being chosen is that I am now the means by which the Lord Jesus is going to do his work. And by the way, the thrust of Ephesians is about the community of the people of God, about the church being together active rather than just lots of individuals. That's the thrust there, which is what being chosen in Christ is really about, that we're part now of the way in which he is going to work in the world. And if we see it as meaning that, 
I suggest to you every statement makes sense. Let, let me give you an example of a verse that wouldn't make sense if it doesn't mean that. In, in um, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter says there in verse 10, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. Again, the same word there. Be eager to make your calling and your election sure. What is he talking about? Is he saying, now make your salvation sure? The answer to that is no. And that is because in verse 3 earlier, he says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So he says, we have everything we need for life and godliness in Christ. In verse 4, through these he has given us his great and precious promises so through them you might participate in the divine nature. He says you are already participants in the divine nature. So if you have everything you need for life and godliness in your knowledge of Christ, and if you already participate in the divine nature, why does he say, make your calling and your election sure? I suggest he's saying this. He's saying, make the reason for which you, are, you have all that you need for life and godliness in Christ. Make the reason for which you participate in the divine nature sure, which is that you now on earth are united to Christ, you're on mission with Christ, you're his chosen people, and if God is going to work in the world, he's going to work through people like you. You are part of his chosen people. Make your election sure. Make sure that the purpose of your salvation is being worked out in the way you live, in the things you do, and in the things that are important to you. Get on with a job, in other words. Because you are in Christ, but make your calling and your election sure. Now, I know there's a lot more to say, a lot of things to anticipate and to answer, but we are bound by time, of course. But the second thing I want to talk about is that in both the times he speaks about being chosen, he speaks about being predestined. In verse 4, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Verse 11, we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works at everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In fact, the word predestined occurs only in two passages in the New Testament here, Ephesians 1 and in Romans 8. I'll read you Romans 8 so we understand fully what it says about being predestined. Um, but let me just make this statement that the idea and the important thing about predestination is... It is not about how we became Christians, but what we are predestined to be as Christians. And so in Romans 8, verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And the, those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. There are certain things, he says, that as somebody in Christ, you are predestined to be. This is part of the pleasure of his will. That's what he says in Ephesians 1, and the purpose of his will, also in Ephesians 1, 11. It is that certain things are going to be true of you. The very word itself means about the future. You're predestined to what? Let me, again, try to illustrate this. Some time ago, I was flying from the city of Seattle in Washington to New York with a change of plane in Dallas, and then from New York, I was going to fly on to London. And the flight from Seattle was a little bit late, and I had a very short changeover time in Dallas, so I got off the plane, and I ran to the gate that I knew I was supposed to go to, which on my boarding card said 22A. When I got to gate 22, there was a line of people who were boarding the plane and going through the check, and I joined the line, 
went through the check, onto the plane, sat in my seat. It was a window seat. There was an empty seat next to me, and there was a woman on the aisle seat. When the doors were closed, the aircraft pulled away, and as we began to go out to the runway for takeoff, the captain came on, and uh, he said, our flying time to Oklahoma City is one hour, 55 minutes. <laughs> and I said to the lady next to me, did you just hear what he said? And she said, actually, I wasn't listening, so he just made a mistake. He said, our flying time to Oklahoma City is one hour, 55 minutes, when he should have said, our flying time to New York City is three hours, 50 minutes. And she said in her southern drawl, well, I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to Oklahoma City. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not going to Oklahoma City. I, I'm going to New York City. You're on, not on this plane, you ain't. <laughs> so I pressed the button to call the uh, flight attendant, and the uh, lady came down. I said, I think I'm on the wrong plane. I didn't know you can get on the wrong planes, actually. But anyway, I was on the wrong plane. So she looked at my ticket and said, oh, dear, you're on the wrong plane. Went up to the front. The plane stopped. <laughs> and so we sat there waiting. And then the plane started to go again. This is going out to the, to the runway. And she came back and said, I'm sorry. We can't do anything about it because the New York flight has also left the gate. I'm afraid you're going to have to go to Oklahoma City. <laughs> and we'll work things out when you get there. I said, but I don't want to go to Oklahoma City. <laughs> she said, I'm afraid you have no choice. What she could have said, but didn't say, you are predestined to go to Oklahoma City <laughs> for this reason. You are on a plane that is going to Oklahoma City. And as long as you're in this plane, what's true of this plane is going to be true of you. And so I went to Oklahoma City. <laughs> and actually, it was a great idea because they were so apologetic. And they flew me then up to Chicago, from Chicago across to London. And they put me up in business class on both legs. Uh, which was wonderful, so I tried since to get on the wrong plane, but it doesn't work. <laughs> Security is much tighter than it was then. <laughs> but you see, to be predestined means that where I stand right now, I'm going somewhere. It doesn't tell me how I got on the plane in the first place. It tells me if you're on the plane, there are certain things that are true, which is why being predestined in Ephesians follows both times, he says, you're in him. You're chosen in him. You're chosen in him. And now you're predestined to certain things. That is, that as a believer, whether you feel like it or not, there are certain things going to become true. You're going to share in the sonship of Jesus Christ. That is, what is true of Jesus is going to be true of you. That's why we're predestined to be adopted as his sons. We share the status or the status, I think, is the way we should say it here, of the Son of God. What is true of Jesus becomes true of us. We're caught up according to the plan. It says you have been predestined according to the plan of him who works with everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. You're now caught up in the will of God because you've given your life to him, and he has given his life to you, and now operating in union together, he's going to work out his purpose in your life, as Romans 8, 29 says, that you're predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. You are going to be like Jesus one day. Isn't that fantastic? It won't be in this life. There is a process from one degree of glory to another into his likeness. It will be culminated one day when we are, as Romans 8 also says, glorified. That's a tremendously reassuring statement. I sometimes remind my wife of that. I am going to be like Jesus one day. <laughs> be patient. I am caught into union with him now. And there are certain things that are true of me now that I can't change. And one of them is, I'm going to be like Christ one day. We're predestined for these things. So it's not primarily about how you, it's not about how you become a Christian. It's having become a Christian, what is then going to be its outworking in your life.
when you're in Christ. So, so, so how do you know how to be in Christ? Because that is the key to everything. If you're in Christ, you're chosen. If you're in Christ, you're predestined to certain things. If you're in Christ, you are redeemed by the blood of Christ. If you're in Christ, he makes known to you the mystery of his will, etc. How are you in Christ? Well, he tells us in verse 13. Because he says in verse 13 that you also were included in Christ when, when what? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the pattern, Paul says. You were included in Christ when four things happened. First, you heard the word of truth. And that word of truth was the gospel of your salvation. And as you heard the word of truth, the Spirit of God revealed to you its truth because it is the Holy Spirit alone who reveals to us Christ. The natural mind does not receive the things that come from God. They are alien to him. It is the Spirit who reveals truth to us. It is no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment, who shows us what we are, sin, what we should be, righteous. We, declare, we were created to show the image and character of God and the judgment that is a result of that. You can't argue these things and bring real conviction. It is the work of the Holy Spirit as the word of God, as you heard the word of God, and it is the Spirit of God who draws people. No one comes to, the Father, to, to, to Christ except the Father draw him, Jesus said. So you heard, this is God's business, as you hear, to work in a person's heart. And then he says, you're included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed. That's what you did then. You heard, you believed. What that means is simply this. You acted as though it was true. You took it seriously, and you believed. And having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. You were sealed. You heard, you believed, you were sealed. That is, that the Holy Spirit came to indwell your life. If any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. It is the coming of the Holy Spirit that seals us as one of his and seals us in Christ. And seals simply means, if I can put it in this sort of picture way, that when he came into your life, he locked the door behind him and threw the key away. He is not going anywhere. You can quench him, you can grieve him, but he's not going anywhere. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. For what? Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, guaranteeing it until the redemption of those who are God's possession. So the fourth thing is that having heard, having believed, having been sealed, you've been guaranteed. You're on the way. You're in the plane. You're predestined that certain things are going to happen in your life. Either now, in time, or then in eternity. We have to have a bigger picture of the gospel than simply getting rid of my sin, to ease my conscience, to make me feel better, that I one day get washed up on the shores of heaven. We have to have a much bigger picture than that. That being a Christian is being rescued and placed in Christ, sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit, and in Christ I now share the chosenness of Christ, I am now part, because I'm in him, I'm part of his being chosen as the means by which God is going to bring blessing into the world. 
as I make myself available to him and make my calling and my election sure, I live in obedience and dependence to in him, and I am on a journey which is pre-set, predetermined, that is predestined, that guarantees an inheritance. And I suggest to you that's the message of these verses in Ephesians 1. And Paul is saying, you know, this is such a one long sentence because this is so incredibly fantastic that when you're in Christ and you learn what it means to be in Christ and you learn all the privileges of being in Christ, you learn what it means to be available to Christ and sealed by his spirit in Christ, then your life becomes not only meaningful and purposeful and exciting, but you have the expectancy that as the chosen people of God, I share in the work of God in his son Jesus Christ as his means of reaching into our world. God is God, so God can work outside his church, but as a general rule of thumb, the work of God is always through his church. Because he has chosen his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and placed us in Christ, and therefore we are the means by which God. So we send missionaries. Because God needs people he's going to send. And so the whole full content of the gospel is either implicit or explicit here in these verses. It's the theory of everything. When you know what it is to be in Christ. Because in Christ we have every spiritual blessing. Everywhere in the heavenly realms. And that, may, that means that you and I have what it takes to go out into a world that's dirty and distant and going downstream fast with the ability to be clean, to go upstream, and to be a means of the Lord Jesus Christ making himself known. Well, let's pray together and we'll ask God to write the, certainly the end result of all of this into our hearts. That we might be available to him for whatever he wants to do. Lord Jesus, I thank you this morning in your incredible love and undeserved love and unmerited grace and kindness to us, you have drawn us into relationship with yourself. And thank you for the fullness of what it means to be in Christ, to be united with you, so that what is true of you in a very wonderful way becomes true of us. We stand in your righteousness. We live in your power. We share in your chosenness as the Father works in our world through your body, your church has been united to you. I pray for those amongst us this morning who don't know you in a personal living way. That as only the Holy Spirit can, you'll be opening our hearts and revealing to us yourself and your truth in such a way that there's nothing more sensible in all the world than giving our lives to you and experiencing your forgiveness and your salvation and life in all its fullness. I pray this in Jesus' name.